When it comes to fishing, there's always people willing to tell you how to do it. But right now, I'm going to tell you all the things not to do on your next outing on this episode of Fishful Thinker, the podcast. I'm Chad Lachance, and you're listening to Fishful Thinker, the podcast. All things fishful, all the time. Hey, thinkers, Chad Lachance here. Thanks for joining in. It's a beautiful day here in Colorado as I record this podcast. And, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting topic because there's a bajillion ways to catch fish. There's a bajillion ways to actually fish in the first place. Um, And I'm often a guy to say a favorite quote, uh, there are no wrong answers in fishing, but some are better than others. Well, on this episode, I thought I'd talk about um, the things I've learned not to do over the last 20 years of doing this for a living. Uh, what I've figured out is there's some common mistakes that I, either I make personally, and usually I will catch them when watching our own uh, video stuff from, from production, or mistakes I've just learned where I just look right back immediately and, and realize I made that mistake, or also mistakes I've observed in lots of other anglers, uh, either that fishing with me or on a guide trip with me or things like that. And the mistakes are probably easier to talk about, the common mistakes, than are the correct way or the right way or the secret lure way to go about catching fish. So let's talk about a bunch of that going forward. What mistakes have we commonly made over the years that, uh, that I've tried to learn to be a little bit wiser about? And, and the thing is this, wisdom is the ability to recognize a mistake before you make it. But to recognize that you have to have experience with it, even if it's secondhand, and experience is one of those things you need before you have. So for me to learn from mistakes and pass them on with you, to you, hopefully will help you in the long run and catch some more fish. So let's talk about some of the biggest mistakes that I commonly make uh, myself and that I really, really despise doing because I still commonly will make them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of those mistakes is without question, leaving fish to find fish. And this one's really getting driven home to me lately with as we've put a, a year's worth of use on live, real-time, forward-facing or down-facing sonar in real time. Leaving fish to find fish is one of my biggest pet peeves. It's something I've most commonly done mistake-wise. And it's something I still do today because we always have that grass is always greener vibe going on. And maybe I could catch them faster over there or maybe they're bigger over there or whatever the case might be. But there's a couple of reasons why leaving fish to find fish can be a big mistake. First of all, half the battle in catching fish is locating fish. So if you've already got fish located, well, you're ahead of the curve right there. So maybe you're better to sit there and figure out how to get the fish you have located to bite than you are to go driving around or walking around or whatever it is that you're doing to go to another fishing spot. doesn't matter if I'm on the bank or um, in the boat or anywhere in between. If you've got them located, you've got a big part of it done. And getting them to bite's the next part, but at least you don't have to worry about, are they there? And another possibility of that why leaving fish to find fish can be bad is because you might find somebody else's on there. So let's say you're a derby guy, a bass fishing guy, or walleye fishing derby guy, or a fly guy that has a really great run in the river somewhere. You're going to pack up and you're going to leave fish that you're sitting on because maybe they're not biting or maybe they're not biting as fast as you like or whatever. You're going to show up at your next spot and somebody's going to be there. Um, that is always a risk that you take whenever you spend the time and effort to leave fish and go find fish. Another possibility, even worse than that, is you get there and you don't see anybody there, but what you don't realize is they left 10 minutes before you got there. And then you really have a problem because maybe they sat there and beat on your fish for the last three hours, and you don't understand why they're not biting when you get there. <clears throat> and they might be fish that even show up on your sonar unit, but they won't bite when you get there. So that's a possibility. Um, obviously, you have the possibility that the fish just flat aren't there anymore, that that particular school of fish has moved on and, uh, and left your spot. And that's another possibility. Another possibility is that they're there and they're just not doing anything different than what your other fish were. Uh, and so you still wasted the time to go there. So my preference 
if at all possible, is to stay on fish as long as I possibly can, even if it means rotating through a whole bunch of different presentations or flies or whatever it is, to ensure that they're not going to bite anymore. It might mean changing my casting angles up. It might mean changing slightly my depth range. If I'm fishing a piece of structure, maybe I fish right around that piece of structure. Maybe I back off of those fish for five minutes and sit there with an anchor down or just sit on the bank and not fish and let them regroup and reset and then start fishing again without actually leaving them there. I've done that a lot of times in tournament situations where I was afraid if I left, somebody else would pull in on my spot. But if I sit here and continuously cast all day, those fish won't bite. They'll tune into what's going on and they won't bite. So in that situation, maybe you're better to just camp on them for a little bit, work on your tackle, have some lunch, whatever it is you need to do, uh, and see if you can get them to bite when you get back up and get ready to go. That can be an excellent, an excellent way to handle it. But leaving fish at the end of the day doesn't work out at least half the time and um and or it doesn't work out any better if you consider it doesn't work out any better then i would say it's more like three quarters of the time it's not that often that if i know i'm around fish and i leave them uh that i do so much better somewhere else now the scenario of of different than that that i'll throw out there and not to dwell on this one point too much but i'm going to dwell on it more because again it's one of the most fundamental mistakes there are times when your fish have changed size. And long story short, fish will segregate by size in a lot of scenarios. And so you might have a particular area that you you like to fish, you pull in there, and it's got a bunch of babies on it instead of quality fish. Well, in that scenario, particularly with something like smallmouth bass, it's pretty common that I'm going to pick up and leave. So I'm going to leave those fish because they aren't the right fish. Uh, same thing in tournament fishing. You get on a school of you know two or three pounders, and you go, oh man, I can catch these all day long, but it's kind of a sucker move because you need four pounders to catch fit or to win the tournament, I should say. And it's not about just catching fish. That's why you see so many tournament pros that say, oh, I'm going to go get my five, get my limit real quick, and then they go looking for big ones because they want to make sure that they get those fish and usually they'll have a spot that they can go get some some average keepers just to make sure they have five fish in the live well all day long. Incidentally, if you are a tournament guy, my feeling on that is go look for your big ones first. If you're that confident that you can go get five that easy, go look for your big fish first because you might be the first guy on them, which will help for one. For two, you'll have the early morning on your favor uh, in a lot of cases as well. And so I'm going to go look for my big ones because, to me, if I'm in a tournament, I want to win. I don't want to finish fourth or ninth or top ten or any of that. I want to win. So if I know it's going to take four pounders to win, what good does it do me to go get a bunch of two pounders and fill my live well just to call them out later? So, no, I'm going to go look for my four pounders right off the bat. And if I don't stumble into some other fish while I'm doing that, then I probably didn't have a very good fishing day in the first place. And most tournament days are eight hours long of regular length tournament day and therefore you got eight hours to catch five fish and I would be more inclined to stop at my limit spot on the way back to the way in than I would be on my way out in the morning that's just my two cents worth Uh, just for the record I coached and won the high school national championship with that mindset we said no it's a it's a catch bigs or or die trying and uh, and and that worked out for us and we did in fact stumble into average size fish while we were looking for our big ones such that we limited out quickly every day anyway rather than going to a pocket that was loaded with two pounders that we could have caught you know 20 minutes in we'd had a limit so anyway leaving fish to find fish big mistake if you can still catch onesie twosies here and there stay there as long as you can change things up and keep trying to catch those fish another huge mistake and this one i see all the time and i i feel like that it's a a mistake that people just shouldn't make anymore. And that is throwing the same angles all the time, whether it be you're working down a bank and you're throwing the same angle the whole time, uh, whether it be you have a key spot that you really like and so you throw the same angle the whole time as you pull in there because you approach it the same way, you throw the same way. That's not going to be a good deal in a lot of cases. You're better off to mix up angles so much, though, that there's an entire podcast in our series here that that is dedicated to angles and why I think they're so important. So if you do nothing other than change your angles up on a regular basis, 
even over the course of, say, I'm working down a bank and I'm making the same 45 degree ahead of the boat cast. So about every fifth cast needs to be back the other direction in my appointment, in my opinion, throwing 45 degrees behind the boat and work the bait back. Because what you'll find is you're fishing over fish with your angles in a lot of cases. Now, I learned that was by fishing out of the back of people's boat where I worked the opposite angle of them and caught lots of fish fishing right behind them. So your cast angles, as far as relation to your structure, will change or your cover will change when you throw the other direction. Your retrieve will change. Maybe a fish didn't see your bait going one way. He'll see it better going the other way. Maybe, maybe, just maybe. Uh, the first time you threw going one direction, you spooked him with it because you came in behind him. I mean, there's just all different things that, that are possible. But mixing up your angles rather than fishing the same angle all the way down a bank uh, can really, really be a common thing. And I fished with several high-level pros that didn't do that in, in the same tournament. I fished a tournament at Bull Shoals with, with three guys. or Actually, I was a marshal in the tournament at Bull Shoals. I'm not going to name names. But guys were on the exact same pattern two days in a row. And the fish bit like mad. Everybody was catching fish really good. The first guy I fished with going down the bank, or he constantly threw the same angle all the way down. All these different 45-degree rock banks we went down, he threw the same angle every time because that's where his comfort level was with his casting, with, you know, with his right hand, and then switching rod to his left hand and retrieving a very traditional crankbait pattern. The next guy I fished with, with about every third cast, was throwing an angle backwards the, down the bank so that his, he was, he'd throw two or three in a row the same angle, then he'd throw one or two the other direction, then he'd go two or three in a row the same angle, throw one or two the other direction. He completely smoked the guy the first day fishing ex, literally some of the same exact banks with exactly the same lures. Everybody was throwing wiggle warts in that tournament. Uh, just by changing that angle and being in the boat with him and seeing how effective that was, was... Uh, an eye opener because he probably threw a third as many casts on the backwards angle, but I would be willing to bet that half of his fish came on that angle. Uh, not that I was keeping that close a track. They were catching something like 30 keepers a day. So, uh, but yes, he was catching a good number of his fish and quite a few of them as larger fish by switching that angle. So mixing the angle up when you, when you're working down a scenario, uh, is a great thing to do or conversely not mixing it up is a rookie move. Another rookie move that I see a lot in similar lines to angles is getting your rod out of shape, getting your not paying attention to where your rod in, is in position to whatever bait it is you're throwing or in your retrieve. I see guys get the rod pointed straight up and, and beyond, so it's pointed behind their head as they work a bait to them. That's fine, but you have no way to set a hook when you're in that scenario. Also, you've lost a significant amount of sensitivity in that scenario, and your line watching goes out the window. So making sure that you keep your rod in a good position all day long is a really important thing. And I see guys get lazy uh, to where they're not doing that. Uh, bad juju. Uh, along those same lines, not watching your line. You have to watch your line. If you're a jig, drop shot, uh, finesse guy of some sort, not necessarily something you're straight winding, but something that's either falling or you're dragging, something like that. If you're not watching your line all day long, you are making a mistake. And I see that mistake all day, every day on guide trips. It's a very small fraction of people that I fish with that are ardent line watchers to where they don't make that mistake over the course of the day. At some point in the day, they will lose focus. They'll be looking all different directions, watching the pretty birds and some fancy boat or some girl on a paddleboard and not paying attention and invariably fish get away when you do that. So if you really want to catch the most fish, watch your line all day long. Don't make the mistake of getting suckered into not watching your line or getting complacent and thinking you're going to feel all your bites. Because if you think you're going to feel them all, I hate to break it to you, but you're not going to feel them all. A lot of them are going to be uh, visually detected, not with feel. And that includes in one of my favorite presentations is suspending jerkbait. If I jerk a jerk bait down and then I pause it and let it hang in the water column for five seconds, half the time I know I'm bit is because the, the line will start to pull one direction or another, or there'll be a jump. You'll see the line actually jump, and it's why I use a very visible line when it comes to jerk bait fishing because I want to be able to see that line such that when the jerk bait is paused in the water column, I can see it get bit rather than relying on them on feeling it to get bit. And I'm of the belief that a lot of what you feel is the fish spitting your bait out, not picking it up in the first place. So watching your line, big thing to do, or conversely, a huge mistake if you don't uh, take care of it. 
Speaking of line, Thai fresh knots. Big, I've done other podcasts about that. Thai fresh knots. I don't care if you're fishing with six pound test or 20 pound test. If you're fishing with nylon or fluorocarbon monofilament, either one, you need fresh knots. And it doesn't mean fresh knots after a fish pulled on it hard. It doesn't mean fresh knots after you snagged it and pulled on it only. I mean fresh knots like every 15 or 20 minutes or half hour of fishing time, even if nothing happens. And the reason is this, the knot, when you cinch it, no matter how good you are at tying knots, that's still the weak link in your tackle. And the older a knot gets, the longer it cinched, the more pressure it's under, even just from the force of casting it, the weaker and weaker and weaker it's going to get. And the biggest heartbreaks I've had is looking at it and making a quick decision, oh, it'll hold up for a cast or two. I did one on, on Fishful Thinker Television where we pulled up on a mat it was the only mat in the whole, like a flooded debris mat where a bunch of debris pushed in the back of a pocket and there was a mat there. And, and anyone that's done very much bass fishing over the years knows there's likely to be a fish underneath that. Same thing with a foam pocket in the river or something like that uh, for a trout guy. <clears throat> very important to fish those mats. Well, I didn't have any tackle out. We hadn't been fishing those. Like I said, it was the only one around. So I didn't have any tackle on the deck of the boat appropriate for punching through that mat. I get in the, in the rod locker, I pull out a big old heavy flipping stick. It's got uh, fluorocarbon on it. I had been fishing with it uh, some other pond, I don't even know. Jig was tied on it. I was like, okay, that's close enough. If there's a fish underneath there, if, if this jig goes through there, he's a good chance he's going to bite it. I thought about it. I even looked at it. thought, oh, but it's heavy. It's heavy fluorocarbon. It's either 17 or 20 pound fluorocarbon. Went ahead and made the pitch. I literally thought about it. Didn't do anything about it. Made the pitch. Bait goes through the mat on the first drop. Boom, gets bit right on cue. Camera's rolling for the whole thing. Everything's perfect. I jerk on that thing. I'm at my best rolling Martin hook set. And it popped immediately right at the knot. And I got a little curly cue right there. And there's no way that that would have broken had that been a fresh knot. But it wasn't a fresh knot. It was a knot that had been used then put in the rod locker and left there for who knows how long, and then brought out of the rod locker and thrown, and the knot failed on the first pitch. And that is heartbreaking. It's really heartbreaking if you're filming or you're, you're in a tournament or anything like that, and that's exactly what happened to me right there. Another similar scenario was with braided line, because even braided line is not immune to being constantly checked and re-knotted. What I mean by checked is checking the bottom 10 or 12 feet of your line and making sure that it hasn't been rubbed on a dock piling or a rock or tree limbs or whatever you're fishing around, um, your, even, even your tippet in the river, whatever. Uh, I had braided line. I'm, I'm tying, good, getting ready to tie it up, to tie a lure on. Again, we're filming. Camera guy says, hey, man, look at that braid. It looks like there's a nick in that braid. He can see it. I reach up. I feel it. Oh, yeah, there's a tiny little nick there. And I, we debate. I literally debated with him like an idiot. <laughs> no, man, it's good. It would be all right. I'm just going to make a couple of casts with it. I go ahead, and, and on top of that, just to add insult to injury, I went ahead and tied the lure on where all I had to do was cut the braid shorter and put it on there, but I didn't. No, nope, no problem. I pitch a soft stick worm at Berkeley General in on something. On It's on it's on a, like 15-pound braid of some sort at the time. It's a couple of years ago. Pitch it in there, gets bit, pow! I break the fish off on the hook set, breaks right where that fray was on braided line with a spinning rod. So... Again, check the bottom of the line and tie a fresh knot. If you don't feel any anything on the line that's wrong, run it through your fingers. If you don't feel anything that's wrong with the line, fine, but at least put a fresh knot. If you feel anything in that bit of line, cut it there and tie from there up and don't take those chances. Fresh knots, very, very important. Another mistake that I see people do on a common basis is they're married to a lure. Last time I was out on whatever lake, this particular lure caught all my fish, and now it's my favorite lure, and I got a ton of confidence in it. I see this more with with amateurs than I do pro guys, things like that, but I have seen it even with pro guys that are really addicted to a lure that won them a bunch of money recently, uh, something like that. You have to fish with an open mind. So making that mistake that, whoa, they loved this lure last week, so they're going to love it this week, is a very, very big mistake. Um, or it could even be on the same day when the conditions have changed. Well, they bit it good this morning, so I'm sticking with it all day until they bite it again. And that's just not a good scenario. It's The, the problem with that is going to be that 
the, you have to fish with an open mind. You have to understand that the conditions change, the fish change, the temperatures change, the water clarity change, the light change, maybe you even change lakes. You have to pick your lure based on your conditions you're faced with right then, not what somebody else told you they caught them with yesterday. I mean, keep that in mind. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying discard the information, but don't live and die by it. Make sure that you are fishing with enough of an open mind that, hey, if that fancy lure of yours that caught them so good yesterday isn't catching them today, that you're quicker to make a change uh, than you might otherwise be. And along those same lines is just fishing memories in general. This spot was really good yesterday. Well, that doesn't, the fish don't care about that. Maybe they do and maybe they're still there, but if you're there for 10 minutes and they're not, don't beat it up all day unless you really expect the fish are going to come back to you for some reason as in a, maybe a tidal related situation where, hey, when the tide changes, they'll come here or whatever the case might be. Just because you caught them there yesterday or last week or last year during the same month, which is the one I see very commonly, um, does not mean it's going to be good this time. So fishing memories in general is bad juju. Your memories are good experience, okay? They're good to have and they're good to use to make your decisions going forward, but they are not the end-all, be-all to catching fish in the same way, whether that be with regards to a lure or a spot or a technique of any sort or whatever. Keep an open mind the whole time you're fishing. That's a very, very big one, and uh, and that's something that I see in all outdoorsmen of all kinds. It, this this mountain was a really good deer mountain last year during the rut, and there's none here this year. Well, you don't know if the berries are different, that whatever the scenario is, you some something the deer detect that you can't. They're not there now, so it doesn't matter if you're a hunter or a fisherman. Really, it's being open minded, not fishing memories or what you last had success doing. By the same logic, what didn't work, just because that lure didn't work the first time you tried it or the last time you tried it, doesn't mean it won't work this time. So for me, when a, let's say a bait comes out that, I, that I'm that i not familiar with, for, for a bait to earn my trust or, 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 or conversely to earn my disapproval, it takes a whole season of fishing with it. It doesn't take like two days. Well, I went out today and I caught you know, the whole pile of crappies with it. It was a great crappie dude. Not necessarily, but over the course of a summer, if that thing continuously produces more consistently, then okay, then now it's earned my trust. Or conversely, if it doesn't produce in a variety of scenarios. And as a guy that tests lures for one of the largest companies in fishing, pre-production type lures, I can tell you that that's very important that you don't live and die by a small data set. You need a whole bunch of data, which really requires a whole season of fishing uh, under a variety of scenarios, a variety of weather, my case, a variety of lakes and rivers and, and reservoirs, ponds, the whole nine yards. That's really how you, you've got to, to make your decisions, not based on a one-off deal. Uh, any one bait could do any one thing on any given day. So that's another key thing. If you're a boater, I've got a really good one on this one. If you're a boater, uh, another one can be not paying attention to boat control. And this one I see a lot, used to drive me crazy when I fished as a non-boater, paying very close attention to boat control all the time. Boat control will catch you fish, you'd be surprised. And what I mean by that is either keeping my boat at the right place so that I can make the angles I need to throw, where my the, the aforementioned forward and backward angles or whatever, if I'm, if I'm not paying attention to that, it's, uh, it's not going to be good. If I'm too far or too close, if I'm too far, I can't make accurate presentations. If I'm too close, I'm going to spook fish in a lot of scenarios. That can be a problem. Uh, another boat control issue is just flat getting the boat moving too fast because then you observe something, but it takes a big dose of trolling motor to get that boat to stop once it's moving forward in a, in a rate you know, a certain direction. So I like to move the boat just fast enough to keep me effective, but not so fast that I have any chance of not being able to control the boat. And most of the time, I feel like people fish over fish rather than fish too thoroughly. Uh, I think the, the more control you have of the boat all the time, the better off you are. If you have a way to, to stop your boat without always deploying a physical anchor, in other words, a shallow water anchor in the boat or a GPS anchor on the trolling motor or if it's calm enough that you can just stop. I'm a big advocate of, of stopping the boat of every certain amount of distance and making a bunch of presentations if I think I'm around fish because when the boat is moving, 
particularly with any sort of a contact bait, like a, a jig or a, a finesse jig of some sort or, or a, you know, a Texas rig, something like that, when the boat is moving, now it's hard to watch your line. It's hard to um, really get a vibe on is what's, what's going on with it and hard to fish slow enough. If the boat slows down or stops, you can fish more thoroughly and more slowly. And in a lot of cases, that will catch you fish. Another one along those same lines, boat control, but not really the same, is getting on top of fish uh, that are shallow. And this is an offshore thing as opposed to being on a bank. So, you know, the top of the humps, say 15 feet. Well, I can get on top of those fish. Well, maybe all the little guys, but a lot of the big ones, by the time they've gotten big, if they're on that hump, when you park a 3,000 pound boat right on top of them, particularly if the trolling motor's whirling, uh, you might have a hard time catching those fish. Whereas if it's 35 feet deep, maybe not so much, but you have to be cognizant of maybe I'm better staying back off of this a little bit and throwing to them rather than getting my boat right on top of them. And that can be a big one. Uh, Similarly, along those lines is trusting your electronics too much in shallow water. And this is a huge one because people don't understand how narrow the beam is on their electronics, particularly guys that are relatively new to using their electronics. Traditional sonar is somewhere around a 20 degree cone, okay, which means you're looking at about 30% of the depth of the water in terms of the width of your cone where it's contacting the bottom under your boat. Well, my boat's eight feet wide, which means just to get to the width of my boat with my cone, I need to be in 24 feet of water or more. Well, if I'm zipping back and forth over a spot looking for fish and it's only 20 feet deep, I'm not even, I'm not even looking outside of what's directly under my boat, which means I would have to grid that thing pretty hard to have 100% confidence that fish aren't there. Now, somebody's going to say, oh, well, you can use your side scanners. Well, maybe within reason, but that doesn't do you a great job of showing uh, fish as well as it does structure of some sort. If you've got modern forward-facing sonar, yeah, you can use that. That'll give you a much better chance of what's going on for sure in shallow water, but I know a small percentage of you have that at this point. So don't make the mistake of thinking you can idle back and forth over a spot that's that's 15 feet deep and decide there's no fish there because it's pretty easy for fish just to get out from under your boat. You know, uh, Same thing with fish high in the water column. I had a buddy of mine who just told me, you've trolling down the lake. He's like, I didn't mark any fish all night. But I already know that those fish are inside of 10 feet of the surface uh, just based on how they've been feeding for the last couple of weeks. Well, you're not marking them because they're getting out from under your boat before you get there. They're not going to show up on your graph at that point. So you can't trust, and particularly in shallower situations, that you're going to be able to mark all the fish that are there. If you see one, I, I have a lake trout buddy told me one time, if you see any fish on that structure at all, water's 30 feet deep. If you see one fish on that structure, you need to stop and fish it for all you're worth because you're only looking at a small percentage of the bottom. So back off it right away and cast to it because if you saw one, the chances are there's going to be more there. Don't mess around looking at it every which way and run the risk of spooking them. One fish, because you're fishing for lake trout, they're not giant schools of fish. There's going to be two or three or four of them. I only need to mark one to tell me that there's good potential there. And just for the record, the day he t- gave me that advice was my probably most productive day of fishing in freshwater ever, uh, landing five gigantic lakers in one day on film. I spotted one fish each time we started fishing. And in two scenarios, I caught two of them off that same spot. And uh, you can't you can't look at it and say, oh, there's no fish here, so I'm not fishing. Or conversely, there's, you know, I saw a whole bunch of them right here and they're right underneath the boat. So there must be some, some big ones here as well. You need to look around as far as that goes. And, and particularly in shallow water, understand how narrow your cone is or on very steep structure, a very small percentage of fish are going to show up on, on really steep structure, particularly if you're paralleling that structure as opposed to going straight to it or straight off of it. So keep that in mind. Uh, well, I didn't, I didn't mark hardly any fish or no fish at all on this dam. Well, making one pass down it, uh, looking at what you think is the right depth range is going to be wrong because it's going to be where your cone, your sonar cone is touching the dam that's going to get your strong signal, which may not even be under your boat, depending on how deep the water is, or it might be directly under your boat and fish could be slightly off to one side or the other and you're never going to see them on your graph. So that's important as well. So if your vibe is telling you this fish there and everything you're seeing, you see one or two on your graph, maybe you need to fish there and make the fish prove to you they're not there rather than go the other way around. So that can be key. 
The last one I'm going to throw out here, um, because I could go on with mistakes all day long. I've made all of them. One of them that I see a lot is just not being quick enough to change in general. When something changes, and maybe it's even being lazy, when something changes, I mean, change, changing right now can make all the difference in the world of having the confidence to say, I'm going to change right now. It's part of the reason I carry a lot of tackle, a lot of rods, rods and reeled combos, because I can rig different things for different scenarios. Uh, I might, if I'm on a good jerkbait bite, I might have a chrome jerkbait on one rod and on an identical rod and reel setup, I might have either a bright colored one or a bone colored one or whatever the case might be. The reason being, as soon as the cloud comes over, I'm going to set the chrome one down and pick the bright colored one up and throw it. I'm not going to wait three more casts or five more casts. I'm going to go ahead and make that change immediately because I'm fine tuning my scenario as I go. Uh, that can be a really, really key thing is is instantaneous decisions and there's you know i've heard bassers say oh i have a 10 minute rule if i go 10 minute without catching one okay that's fine if you have a situational change uh like i just mentioned like a cloud comes over the sun that's quick business change that right away if you swap from one end of of, of a you know a bay to another and the water's dirtier here or it's windier here just because I was catching really good on a silent bait up in the calm end of the bay, if there's some in the windy end of the bay, uh, maybe I'm going to need a much louder lure. And, I'm, and if my gut would tell me I would need a louder lure, I'm not even going to worry about what I caught him with before. I'm going to make that change instantaneously. And that's really um, something that is the seat of the pants. It's something that requires confidence. And you have to be willing to be wrong and switch right back. But the beauty is it doesn't take any longer to switch back as it did to switch away. So that's another thing that I think if you focus on, you you do really well. So I hate to have a whole podcast, you know, dwelling on the negative things that happen. But sharing information is really important. And, and most of my biggest train wrecks on film or on guide days have been when I didn't pay attention to the things I just mentioned in this podcast and as soon as I let one of those, I get lazy about one of those things, then the wheels come off, and it's just not a good scenario. So I want you to learn from my mistakes rather than having to make them on your own. So if you learned anything from this podcast, please subscribe wherever you're listening. We'd appreciate that very much. Also, uh, you you possibly may be listening on our YouTube channel. Please check out a bunch of the videos there at Fishful Thinker. We'd appreciate that. Uh, subscribe to that. The the YouTube channel is a labor of love. There's more than 500 videos there for a reason, and we post them on a regular basis. And it's not because we like to show off fish. It's because we like to teach people how to catch fish. So uh, please check that out. Also at Fishful Thinker on Facebook or Instagram, and most importantly on Altitude Sports and Entertainment on whatever your provider is and World Fishing Network on television. Many days a week, uh, we're on there a bunch. So anyway, thanks for listening. This has been Fishful Thinker, the podcast.